Hello and welcome. This is Paul Curley and welcome to this month's webinar on College Financial Planning Landscape Update 2021. Today, has, today is August 20, uh, 31st, 2021. I'm your host, Paul Curley. I'm the Director of 5T9 and Able Research with ISS Market Intelligence. And I'm here with uh, Tara Chang. She's in our marketing department. Um, please feel free to say hello, hello, Tara, anytime. Jump in, say hello, welcome to the group, and it'll be great. So today in, in this webinar series, there's the goal of the series is threefold. First, it is to share and learn. We're also here to support the 529 and ABLE uh, community. Long story short, we're looking to build long-term growth for institutions, advisors, and families. And we look to do that by raising awareness, understanding, and prioritization of 529s and ABLE. And what this webinar series is, is one way, one great way to, to help us accomplish that. We also see it as an extent as an extension of what what it is that we do. Now, on the right side, we can see the the photos from the 529 conference 2019 and uh, 2018, and and of course we are pivoting that in-person focus to the to the uh, virtual environment right now. And if if one looks at the photo, the the top right one, you can see uh, some folks you know stopping along, talking to people. That's actually Chris here from the census, and and um, you know walked along. And the, the lower one, uh, Julie. Uh, from IFA is, is uh, running by and talking to a few folks before presenting the essential seminar. So we we like to, to bring that uh, energy forward to our webinars as well. Today's webinar is, is our 12th uh, in the series from the 2020 to 2021 webinar series. And um, that is, you know, so for, for August, we'll be doing the college financial planning landscape update. But, you know, for, for this series, we can see the recordings at that link below. So you can patch in, uh, learn more probably have the recording, today's recording put out later later tonight or tomorrow, but um, long story short, thank you for the support and, and we we will continue to evolve the sessions over time. And so thank you for the, the feedback and support. Before we jump in, let's talk about the 529 Conference 2021. It's currently scheduled November 2nd to 4th at, at the uh, Ritz-Carlton Orlando, Florida. And that's the website, 529conference.com. You can take a look at the registration page the speaker lineup and all the different information is, is currently on the website. The 529 Essentials is, is really something where we bring in all these different speakers. It's a full day uh, soup to nuts uh, boot camp on, on 529 plans. And then for a day and a half, we do a 529 conference where we have more traditional uh, presentations and speakers and, and, and things of, of that nature. And then we pivot over to the ABLE Summit, which, which is a, a, a string of um, product training and, and sessions that are more geared towards ABLE accounts. So as a quick note, the ABLE, uh, uh, the early bird registration rate closes today. So register while you can, go to 529conference.com. Thank you. Today's agenda, we're gonna cover three topics. The, as we like to do uh, in each and every one of these webinars, we, we start out with some industry announcements, what's going on from a, a legislative product marketing distribution perspective. We'll provide a new update on market data from second quarter 2021. And then for, for this um, specific webinar, we're going to focus a lot more on college financial planning landscape update. And at the end, we'll, we'll do a dedicated question and answer se session. We'll try to do our best to do uh, questions and answers throughout as well. So feel free to chat. There's a, there's a chat bar at the, at the um, side so you can see some instructions here on, on you know, where to drop in the questions. We don't have a, 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 the questions and answers are viewed by us and then we can publish the questions and answers as well if, if, um, if it works out that way. But um, you know, so that just to say that they're, that they're not public until we uh, sort of approve it. Uh, but in the meantime, we, we did want to ask an attendee poll, uh, what is your relationship to the 529 market? And so I'll, I'll go in and release the uh, start polling and we'll, we'll start to get some responses. Okay, great. So yes, we're starting to get some some feedback in there. All right. Learn, learning a new uh, platform is, is always good, but you know, uh, Big Mark has been very helpful. So, so right now, at, and I'm not sure if you can see it on your side, but 24% of today's attendees are product providers or distributors. 
47% are state agencies and treasury departments and about 30% other, and, and of, of that 30%, you know, there's that 12% uh, are, are broker dealer home offices or, or financial advisors themselves. So it, lo, lo and behold, what we've been finding over time is that about a third of our webinars are, are in that product provider uh, category, about a third state and a third of that broker dealer home office advisor uh, category. So thank you so much for the feedback. And of course, always feel free to, free to drop recommendations um, for future webinars to us as well. Still, uh, still drinking some some coffee right there, but uh, in, in three announcements, so, so let's, let's jump in. The 529 and legislative updates. So within the 529 um, savings plans, where, where where the industry is is focusing on right now is expanding qualified higher education expenses to secondary credentials. And when I did some research around secondary credentials, one of the key areas that that is um, you know really helpful is is really the the career education field. So so think about teachers or or all the different things that teachers need to do to get get, get different credentials. Usually it's not a, an additional um, crowd program, but sometimes it is. But it's really, if you think about all these different credentials that teachers need to do in order to um, become you know, teachers at different levels, uh, traditionally that, that was not a qualified higher education expense. So it's a great storyboard about how 529s, broadly speaking, are becoming more and more broader and more um, able to be used. So it's, it's a great um, positive momentum story. And then also like pivoting over to ABLE, there's a fairly large conversation around the ABLE Age Adjustment Act, um, which would increase the age of eligibility from 26 years old to 46 years old. Um, there's been really good momentum in, in both the Senate and the House. So, so at S331, the, the Senate bill, you know, currently has one sponsor and 12 co-sponsors. The House, um, so in our, in our 529 Dash weekly uh, newsletter, we've been updating in, you know, that, that status board, how many have signed it. And it seems like not a week goes by where there isn't a, another co-sponsor, you know, signing that bill. So, so broadly speaking, from a legislative perspective, ABLE and 529 is, is broadening usage and just really just building upon uh, prior success. So, so that's a you know very good positive news. And when we pivot over to, you know, industry announcements and updates, uh, recently there's been a release uh, by the state of Arizona for a RFP for a program manager for the advisor sold plan. So, um, you know, that they're, they're they're, they put out an RFP. They're looking for for a new program manager. Uh, the current the current plan name is Ivy Invested, and uh, broadly speaking, the Ivy parent uh, of parent company of Ivy uh, with Ellen Reed was acquired by Macquarie Asset Management. So it's sort of um, I, I think the timing of the RFP aligns with with that sort of you know, company um, you know acquisition. So. So lo and behold, we'll see what, what happens with, with the result of, of that uh, plan. In July, there was another update from, from Colorado. So there was a change in program managers from, from Leg Mason to Duveen. So that, that plan is launched and, and live. And so, so congrats and, and kudos to uh, College Invest, which is the state of Colorado's team, but, but also uh, Nuveen over there as well. In July, there was, um, you know, from Nebraska's TD, Ameritrade 529 program was was relabeled to Bloomwell 529 uh, Education Savings Plan. Primary distributors uh, changed from TD Ameritrade to Union Bank and Trust. Trust. So, congrats to Union Bank and Trust and, and Jay Steinocker and, and that team there. Um, and in September, coming up ne next month, you know, broadly speaking, around uh, it's been announced, and, and so we. Um, expect or, you know, for, for Maine's direct and advisor sole plan that there'll be a change in program manager and administrator, um, you know, for that program as well. So, so a lot of pl plans, um, you know, on the move in the 529 savings space and, and that there's been certain changes that have taken place. There's some in the pipeline and, and some RFPs going through. So um, a, a lot going on there. And, and similarly within the ABLE uh, plan to update space, there's, there's, you know, several updates. So in August, you know, Maine announced that they will be launching the ABLE program, um, you know, later on, on this year with, with Bangor Savings um, sa Savings Bank. Uh, sa I think it's <laughs> Bangor Savings Account with, with, through Bangor Savings Bank. But it's, it's a, I think it's a great storyboard because it really reiterates that the, the importance of banks and in-person uh, banking, you know, uh, within the ABLE uh, product space and, and, its, and its target market and, and users. And, and also for, for Utah, they've, uh, they're going through a soft launch tomorrow with, with a with a more formal public uh, launch on, on on or around September 8th. That will be launched in partnership with with the Ohio 
uh, stable program, which is a, 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 a group of states that work together uh, to get economies of scale to, to really, you know, provide a, a great group of a, a great plan um, and get those economies of scale. So congrats to, to uh, Utah, but also Ohio Stable Program. In July, the Ohio Stable Program changed you know, administrators from, from Intuition to BNY someday. So congrats to, to those teams as well. In May, there was, uh, in May, there was an update for Alabama. Um, they, they launched a new program, um, you know, called the Alabama Able Savings Plan uh, with BNY someday as administrator with Nebraska. There was a shift in uh, responsibilities, you know, for, you know, broadly speaking that, you know, going forward, a census will be partnering, you know, with, with Nebraska Treasurer's Office to, to split responsibilities on that specific one. Also, congrats to AKF Consulting and Andrew Fierstein on, on their more recent article about able outreach opportunities abound. They've been doing a great job of, of posting more frequent uh, blog articles, but also rolling that across social media. So, congrats to um, to to to, to uh, Andrew S. Yang and, and uh, Kieran as well. So, we'll be talking to them later today. And for the people on the move section, there's there's two new career opportunities that were uh, released. Uh, Wisconsin Fighting and College Savings Plan has released a open, open uh, rec, um, open release, and they're looking to hire a new college investment program uh, finance officer. So go to wj.wi.gov and you can find the role there. For for uh, New Mexico, they are looking to hire a executive director, and um, so that's the phone number for Lauren. I could have put in her email address, but I figured it'd be. Good to get people to pick up the phone, give her a call, and especially with as much as things go digital, it'd be good to give her a call if you are interested in, in learning more. But of course, in, in this uh, section going forward, if, if you would like to, um, you know, um, if you'd like to have me include anything going forward, just let me know and, and we'll include. So moving over from the industry announcements over to the data and research updates. So for, for from a market data perspective, but the 529 savings plan industry has grown to uh, 14.3 million accounts, investing 437 billion in assets as of the second quarter, 2021. That is the uh, June month end data for 2021. So, you know, broadly speaking, we can see the the track record of success in, in 529 savings plans, and and, and and that chart is a is a chart of assets uh, increasing, and that also fits well to the storyboard we were saying before about the. Uh, legislative momentum that that we're getting within 529 accounts. So, so that's great. Um, and for the able side, we, we also see that for accounts that they broke the 100,000 number of accounts level at the end of the uh, second quarter as well. 100,874 accounts investing uh, 878 million in assets. Broadly speaking, as well, we've seen some good traction. You know from you know, from an assets and accounts perspective and an average account balance perspective, gross sales, um, you know, broadly speaking, that the market is performing well. And, and, and with that, there's just, um, you know, broadly speaking, been more and more uh, new accounts opening and, and um, you know, the accounts getting funded with, with the child tax credits and, and parents putting money to use now that they've already built up the emergency funds with all the different, you know, stimulus payments they, they may have received over time. Um, but we, we do send out an email uh, link to our, our you know market data highlights just sort of announcing these uh, the, those data points being released. We have it in, in our blog articles of, of 529 insiders. We put it in our 529 dash e newsletter, and um, and of course our, our market reports as well. And uh, later on, basically between now and the end of the year, we'll be focusing on the 529 distribution analysis. There's an advisor study that we will be field, fielding. Uh, broadly speaking, that the question is is you know, what is working, what is not working, what do advisors need more from a product marketing distribution legislative perspective. So um, the table below really shows the question around like, you know, you know, the question to advisors of do clients request a, a specific plan? And the answer is no. And and, and the key takeaway from that is really that the advice is the financial advisor determining, you know, which plan is, is being used, um, you know, for, you know, with their clients. So, so lo and behold, it's important to know, you know what, what the advisors need more of. And of course, there's, there's advisors on today's line. So of course, and of course the advisors are, are probably the ones that, you know, filling out the survey as well. So we appreciate your, your time and insight as well. And um, just take a quick look, see if we have any questions have, that have come in. 
course, it's also a good opportunity for me to take a quick coffee uh, sip. So with that, we'll, we'll jump over to the college financial planning landscape update uh, 2021. And within this category, there's probably three different topics that we will be focusing on. It's, it's the big picture landscape um, updates. First is the increasing demand for higher education by families. The second is the topic around tuition inflation and, and how that has caused issues for uh, families, you know, from, from paying, you know, for paying for, for college and, and how that college affordability gap between the rising cost and ability to pay is really, you know, getting filled, lo and behold, by, by the student loan uh, you know, gap. So we'll, we'll talk about that college affordability gap and provide the big picture overview and feel free to drop in questions now or, or during the session or, and we, or we can uh, answer at the end. But, you know, lo and behold, you know, the, that increasing demand for, for education continues. Higher level of education is driving higher income. So what, what this chart really shows is, is basically how the average weekly income for someone with, say, you know, less than high school of, of education to high school to college, but also advanced degrees as well. And with each additional layer of education, on average, you know, more and more people are earning more. And of course, over time, we've seen that that increase as well. So um, in the higher levels of education, you know, is, is in increasing typically faster than, than the other levels of education. So lo and behold, the reason that the, the importance of education continues because more education is driving higher income. But we also see that higher levels of uh, education are also driving lower levels of unemployment. We've seen rapid uh, un unrest, <laughs> if you will, of, of many different market trends in 2020, 2021. But one thing that did continue was the con continuation of the layer cake, if you will, of the unemployment rates. Um, you know, you know, for lead, uh, different levels of education, leading leading to different levels of uh, unemployment. So inverse to last slide, the, the higher the education, the higher the income. This one really focuses on the higher the education, the, the lower level of, of unemployment. Um, and that, that has stayed you know, fairly consistent uh, over time. And, and there's, in, there's even been some periods of widening where, where those with lower levels of education had higher levels of unemployment, as we saw in, it looks like 2009, 2010 period, um, where the unemployment remained higher for longer for those with with high, let's, let's just say less than high of a less than high school degree while the, the other rates were, were shifting lower I think a, a newer storyboard that, we're, that we are saying and, and this co comes from the Boston College Center for Retirement Re Research uh, study are older workers capable of working longer what we've seen in, in the the newer storyboard is is almost like a third slide that we'll probably see over time is that um, you know, broadly speaking, those with higher levels of education are also able to, to work longer and have uh, be able to say like work in, in, in um, safer work workplaces. So there's um, not only does higher education lead to higher income, but also leads to lower unemployment, but also leads to a safer workplace and, and, and therefore longer, longer ability to to work more. Um, I, I can definitely <laughs> agree with that. I, I know when I worked on loading docks in high school um, in, in the early part of, of college during, during breaks and summers, uh, I, I can definitely tell that that I, my body was uh, definitely getting worn pretty hard, uh, you know, doing the work around loading docks. So it's um, I was happy to be able to, to get the education and be able to, to work longer as, as a result. An another important or interesting storyboard is, is the tuition inflation story. So, so basically, uh, tuition inflation continues to outpace workers' ability to, to pay for the higher cost of, of college. So, um, you know, so that th this chart shows the average uh, tuition and fees in, in 2021 dollars uh, over a 15 year period. And the reason why it's important that I found <laughs> was that the importance of it being in 2020 dollars is that that means a um, above and beyond CPI. So, so it, that that um, so if we look at the the tuition increase in the middle, that the the public four year cost of of you know, college, um, you know, going up, say, 45 percent over a 15-year uh, period for, for tuition and fees, that's above and beyond inflation. So um, so 45 percent increase is high. But once you tack on that that additional increase for, for CPI and inflation, it, it actually is, is much higher um, increase in, in college over time. So tuition inflation 
is um, is is above and beyond CPI consumer price index, and and obviously a an, an issue that that must be wrestled with. So we we talked about the increasing importance of of college. Now we're talking about the the increasing cost of of um, of the college, and the, and and I think that this this chart shows a very consistent increase, like two and through 2020, the 2021, and that consistent increase. I guess it's a little bit harder to see it on, on this slide, just the way it is, is laid out, but one can see that it, it is increasing over time. Um, and we'll re re refer back to this this slide 23 later on, but you know, lo and behold, tuition inflation continues to increase to and through 2020, 2021. A lot of the different tra trends uh, did change over, over the time period, as, as we had kind of mentioned, but one thing that has not slowed is just the importance of uh, college financial planning, because even with through 2020, 2022, uh, 2020, 2021, um, you know, the, the, you know, cost, you know, continue to go up and, and the, uh, so did the student loans as well. And when we do our, our projected, you know, cost in, in four year, it, it, of a four year college in 18 years. So we take a look at, you know, where does it cost now and where is it projected to go just based on, on the historical tuition inflation you know, rates, you know, we're, we're looking at a, a four year cost of a private school um, at, at, you know, landing around that, that 388,000 uh, number, of course, I guess I'll, I'll throw on, on my hat for a moment while, while we present that one. But if we go over to the uh, public schools, uh, it's 164,000. So, so we look at Penn State, perhaps I, I'm in uh, the, the Philadelphia area. So Penn State, that would be closer to 164,000 for, for those that are, um, you know, in, in 18 years, and, and of course for that uh, Dartmouth, not not that I went, but my wife did go. Um, it would be closer to that 388,000 number. So that's the projected uh, cost, and so that tuition inflation number just just continues to, to march on. And what's very intriguing, and I, I've presented this slide many different ways, and if we even go back to that first slide, the goal of, of you know sharing and learning, I've I've learned you know many different things in presenting this this slide deck over the years but just sort of like learning how to organize and present through this slide is, has, has been both educational for me but also the audience as well uh, but what we're looking at here is is first at the historical CPI so over you know 10 years the average CPI has, has averaged 1.8 percent so broadly speaking that the, the a, a broad definition of, of what is inflation generally speaking overall is that 1.8 percent. When we look at the the uh, increase in private schools, it's 3.4 percent, and again, that's above and beyond CPI. So it's it's really that 1.8 percent, um, you know, with with that combination of 3.4 percent. So it's, it's closer to that, say, 5.2 percent on, on the private school, and for publics, it's it's you know roughly 5 percent increase, um, you know, every year on average over the past 10 years. In in you know, part of that issue in the storyboard is that when we look at all these different, you know, CPI increasing and, and the cost of college increasing, that one of the the gaps is is really that the, um, you know, the, broadly speaking, the increase in in salaries and in, income is is increasing, say, you know, three point uh, uh, two point three percent for those with a bachelor degree and one point nine percent for those with with an ad advanced degree. So, you know, broadly speaking, you know, the co the cost of living is going up. The cost of college is going up, and then the um, you know the wage um, the, the, the annual wage increase is increasing, but not at, at a pace that would um, you know just be able to um, you know pay for that or, or cash flow the tuition bills as it comes in. I think what's in, intriguing, and, and this introduces it, the importance of of um, you know one one hand increasing income, the second hand decreasing expenses, and, and in turn just using that gap to, to invest, uh, broadly speaking, and get it to get a market performance return. Uh, any of the investment consultants, I, I, I emailed about 10 investment consultants, you know, today, and of course they would um, probably, you know, um, uh, point out many, many different issues of looking at a 60, 40% uh, percent portfolio, 60% equity, 40% fixed income. Um, there's many different issues, you know, with, with that as, as an, as an, assumption, especially as, as different portfolios, uh, you know, continue to diversify many different other scenarios. But, you know, broadly speaking, we've seen a 10.2% increase over the past 10 years, you know, for that investment return. So if we look at, 
you know, CPI at 1.8% that, um, you know, versus a, you know, average, you know, you know, just model portfolio 60-40 at, at 10%. I, I think that kind of shows how one can, um, you know, catch up and fill the gap for, you know, whether it be CPI or, or education. So I, I think that is sort of the, the starting storyboard for for the importance of, of saving and saving it efficiently. So, you know, the importance of education is going up, but so is the tuition inflation. We're starting to introduce the story about, you know, why it's important to, to save and save efficiently. And also the importance of college financial planning. Just put you know, myself a note in the bottom right, the importance of college financial planning is there. And obviously the, the value of, of the advisor in terms of just getting the client to, you know, you know, notice that the that the that the need for savings there, and to, to get started as as early as as possible, and to, to get a plan to, and to fully execute you know said plan. So, shows the value of the advisor to to create that plan, the employer to to provide access to it, and and all the different other or other ways that people learn about college is is just important. So. And that other slide I, I showed on slide 23 about that slow but surely increasing cost of, of college and how over time it is, it is increasing. So let, let me explain what, what this chart shows. This, show, this chart shows how the uh, average, um, that like basically the, the state funding per student over time. So it's, it's, it's um, reported by this uh, state higher education finance uh, team or, or you know website is the state higher education finance uh, group um, and, it, and they collect all the data from all the different states to really say how much money are you you know are, are appropriating per full-time uh, student and that sort and so say the number of students increases five percent and your allocation goes up five percent well you're actually you know staying flat and even uh, per funding for a student. Lo and behold, you know, when, when people try to say like, oh, I, I'll get a scholarship from, from the state, um, this chart shows as at, at best that that uh, red level over, over time is, is just basically hovering, you know, flat. So it's, um, you know, hovering that eight, that eight, eight, uh, eight to nine, ten thousand uh, dollar, you know, per, per student level. So it's, it's been very flat. And that green shows the percentage change over time. So obviously, when the line when the, when the line goes below zero percent, it's it's actually a, a contraction of how much the, the state is is filling the, the college affordability gap. So it, long story short, of saying that the the state's not filling that college affordability gap. And when we pivot over to the federal government, well, you know, it's very very clearly stated in this table that the um, you know federal you know, government is, is not filling that college affordability gap. So, so once again, the, the gap the gap is being uh, created between the rising tuition rates, the you know uh, you know flat to level uh, increases in, in, in income, and then pivoting over to, to the states, providing very flat to decreasing levels of uh, contributions, and, and of course the um, total student aid uh, is, is decreasing as well. And of course, this is a a great breakout because it also shows that when people think about you know federal aid or let, let me get financial aid from from the federal government, that loan number is is of course a, a number that needs to be paid back with with interest. It's just the, the cold hard facts. Um, not saving is is not a plan. Kind of reminder that ta the tax credits is something that you actually have to pay, and then when you file your taxes later, you get the you get the money back. So it's it's still again it's not like this free money you get immediately, like you actually have to front the money and then you eventually get the, the money back through by way of the tax cuts. And, you know, federal work study, it's really, I mean, I, I had three jobs uh, while working three, I had three uh, jobs on campus while taking five job, five classes to, to graduate uh, as soon as possible. So it's uh, work study is not easy either. I mean, it's not, and it's definitely not free money uh, coming in from the federal government um, by way of, of uh, financial aid, you know, grants, you know that being said, you know the the total federal grant grants are there, and and there's many different grant numbers. Um, there's a lot of people who actually specialize in all the different categories. Like, but lo and behold, that when people think about you know the federal, um, you know, sort of uh, just you know cash, it, it it is the the total federal grants, and and that is a number that has decreased 11 percent over that that um, over that time period, 10 year time period. Which is great if you know if the number of people going to college decreased, which it's not. It, it's actually 
the number of people vying for that, that shrinking pot of money is, is actually um, increasing. <laughs> so there's a there's a 23% increase in, in the um, number of enrollment for, for public four-year colleges and a, and a 13% increase in um, you know, private nonprofit for your schools. So you probably speaking have more, more students, um, you know, battling over, uh, flat to decreasing level of, of financial aid. And, you know, what, what is filling the gap? Well, what, what is filling the, the gap within that storyboard is, is student loans. And, um, this is a chart that I, that I take a look at the, the blue, <laughs> the, the blue bar is the, um, you know, just sort of like that overall level. The the red bars on the on below is sort of like how much the student loan has changed year over year. So it's um you know broadly speaking been a been a very continuous up, uphill you know grind in that student loan debt number. Um, you know which of course we're all we're all feeling the, the pain at, at this point. Um, but broadly speaking, we, we you know through 2020 2021 that I, again that the the one trend that that really didn't get impacted was that rise in, in student loans. So the, um, you know, the importance of college goes up, the tuition inflation goes up, the the gap is is not being filled by state and federal governments. And, and then, um, you know, lo and behold, that is, you know, the, that gap is is in lack of planning has been getting filled by uh, student loans. So that's that's the storyboard broadly of, of what what is um, going on on there. You know, and, and, and for this chart, it's, it it is, it starts to introduce the conversation around like what is able to to fill the gap. So the that market performance when we look at the the three, five, and, and ten year you know market returns that S and P five hundred being up fourteen point five percent. So to the extent that people people save and save efficiently um, is is part of the, that that storyboard. You know, you know, and, and from a you know that saving efficiently uh, storyboard really comes from you know that getting a, a market. You know, market return. If we look at 0.7 percent average ten-year return from a from a from a three-month uh, treasury bill, for example, it's great to, to save. But you know, really putting that um, you know money to work, you know, with within the, that investment market, you know, really does help to you know fill that 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 um, you know that that gap. So I, I think that there's a lot of different um, you know storyboards to to go through, but I I, I do think that it, that is very compelling. That you know, families need to save and save efficiently. I I, I don't uh, think we included a, a chart for the historical savings rate, but um, you know, it is important to, to find different ways to to get that that rate up, whether it be for yourself or your client, all the better. Um, and of course, there's all the different conversation points around, you know, just beyond just you know, put like not just saving, but also putting the, the money to 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 work within the the investment marketplace, um, not just treasury bills, but also putting it over to the the investable market to to meet and, and even beat that that rate of, of tuition inflation all the better but also the you know going from there laying on the the, the state and federal tax uh, benefits of 529 plans also the way that the 529s are treated in a, in a beneficial manner uh, within the financial aid um, you know formulas and then of course the, the the state planning perspective and broadly speaking that those are all the different topics that we cover at, at the 529 conference. Um, you know, we, we do have the, the eight hours at the 529 Essential Seminar. So to the extent that we'll, that we'll cover this topic and also just, you know, provide an overview from tax, financial aid, the state planning perspective at the 529 conference. But of course, as we rolling out more and more 529 webinars over time, um, we'll, be, we'll be covering those as well. So we'll be happy to, to cover those. So broadly speaking today at the, you know, when we discussed the college financial planning landscape, we talked about increasing demand for higher education, not just for higher higher income, lower unemployment, but also the, the in, increased in, um, worker safety, but also the longevity of the person to work um, more years as opposed to being forced to retire early due to uh, health, health issues. Um, you know, the increase in demand for higher education, you know, continues. That tuition inflation uh, storyboard continues, that, um, that, you know, the increase in, in college costs continues to rise as they're looking to um, you know, cover their in, increase in costs for having the students on campus. Of course, it, we're, we're in back to school session. So in, in Philadelphia area, we see a lot of the students coming back to, you know, campus and, and um, you know, which is which is great. One of the issues being that the uh, current incomes are, are not keeping pace with that 
tuition inflation number and how the combination of, of all these different story boards are, are creating that widening college affordability gap um, and how that gap is, is not being filled by uh, state, and, state and federal financial aid as is commonly storyboard. That is a myth that <laughs> we tried to um, convince otherwise in, in today's presentation and how that gap is being filled by the st uh, student loan um, debt gap. So um, that's what we covered today. And, and um, we'll be looking over to questions. We'll pause for a moment um, and see if we got any questions come on in. Did receive a, a couple of questions on unable. Um, we are tracking the average average investments uh, for five to nines, but also um, the just closing that up. Yeah, so for the five to nine plans, we are you know capturing the average account sizes, um, average total assets, total accounts, gross sales. Uh, new account sizes, um, gross sales, and, and all the different money flows coming in, in and out of the accounts. Very similar, you know, to um, you know market intelligence um, model to five to nine plans, but also all the other investment products. How is the money coming in? How is the money being used? And what's going on? What's the money is in the account? And how is the money going out? So it's just sort of like a like a product life cycle kind of view to the space, you know. The, like like how how's money coming in like in by way of, of new new accounts automatic contributions one time and what's the what's the size and frequency of the money coming in once it's in how how is it growing how is the um, the investment being allocated to different uh, types of investment options and then lo and behold how is the money getting distributed whether in, in, in blocks over time um, you know where and how and, and where's the money going and what what's the usage and and so we're, we're, we take a, a pretty close look on, on how the, the money is, is moving around from a product perspective within um, ABLE accounts, but also 529s as well. So appreciate the, the questions. And um, you know, as a quick recap, we talked about the industry announcements, the, the, we talked about data and research. Always feel free to, to email me with additional ideas on different sections to, to add in or, or different announcements to include. Today we talked about college financial planning landscape update 2021. We'll be looking to expand to new topics. Feel free to, to drop a recommendation or, or note on, on what we should be covering. But in the meantime, uh, save and save officially. And thank you so much for your time today. So the disclosure statement and uh, contact information for future questions. Thank you.